Hey guys, we are uh, streaming with no delay today, doing our poker clinic session number two. So we turned off uh, chat. It's only it's only going to be sub chat only. Uh, everyone's you know everyone's welcome to go ahead and watch the uh, the poker clinic, but we're we're, we're kind of make this we a, are, uh, shoot. Streaming with we're kind of try to make this uh, you know kind of a subscriber perk. So if you guys have questions about what we're uh, what we're going to talk about. Pop them up in in chat, and we'll try to you know, kind of stop the presentation and going. So, are we are we all on the same page? Everybody on? Go ahead and get the. Uh, okay, how are you all doing, guys? We've got dressed up, classes in session. We are going for the poker clinic number two. We get the. Uh, make sure that our our chat's going on. Am I coming through? Okay. Bob Hatter, good to see you. Dodgy007, good to see some uh, some regulars. It looks like I'm having some issues with our chat. I'm gonna go ahead and keep the chat going on, uh, going going on the laptop, and <sighs> I'm just I'm having issues with like getting on chat. So okay, guys, you know what? We're just gonna go for it. We're just going to go ahead and go through uh, through our script and our clinic. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to you know, stop me at any time. I'll I'll pause the presentation and try to uh, try to address any questions or concerns. Okay. So, thanks again for joining us. We are here at the poker clinic number two. Let's get going. So, uh, just. To uh, remind everybody what we're doing here, who I am, I'm Dutch Boyd, three-time World Series of Poker Bracelet winner. The Poker Clinic is designed to help you with your game, in particular your tournament game. And uh, in our first one, we talked a little bit about chip inflation and uh, changing gears. Today, we're going to talk about four concepts. Uh, we're going to talk about blind stealing. We're going to talk about tapering. We're going to talk about continuation betting and we're going to introduce the concepts of uh, game theory optimal versus exploitive play a very quick breakdown of what game theory is and uh, what we'll we'll talk about game theory in, in, in future poker clinics but we're just going to introduce the concept of uh, game theory optimal versus exploitive and we're going to uh, talk about what it means when we're when we're addressing continuation betting and our post-flop aggression percentages. Uh, real quick, guys, uh, just to make it clear, explo I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the term exploitive. Uh, other people might use the term exploitative. They're, they're both valid words. They both mean the same thing. Exploitative is probably a little bit more common. I don't really like extra, ex you know, I don't really like extra characters, so we're just going to, I would like to see it just be called exploitive, so... Um, that's what I'm going to call it here. We're not calling it exploitative, okay? We're just going to call it exploitive. I'd encourage you guys to do the same thing. Um, let's move on. So basically, in No Limit Hold'em tournaments, you know, the, the, the poker professional, the winner, has a lot of tools at his disposal. You know, he's got uh, you know, thin value betting. He's got inducing bluffs. He's got... Uh, you know, any number of things that we're going to talk about, but the, the you know, hero calls, the main thing, the main tools that the No Limit Hold'em practitioner has, which I think are the most important tools, I mean, it's basically like the hammer and the screwdriver um, in, in the poker player's tool belt, are blind stealing and continuation betting. Stealing blinds and C betting. So, uh... Let's talk about some def you know, definitions. Let's let's define some terms, okay? First off, the blind steal. What is the blind steal? What is stealing blinds? Basically, you know, a, a blind steal is when you are making a pre-flop raise against a small blind and a big blind, and you know, basically hoping that everyone folds. You're you're trying to pick up the blinds and the antes usually without seeing a flop. That's basically what a blind steal is. 
uh, a preflop aggressor. This is a definition that we need to, you know, perhaps define. And a lot of a lot of you guys who have been you know, hanging out on the stream and watching me play these, uh, you know, doing the let's play poker tournaments. You guys have seen me use these terms before. Preflop aggressor, basically the last person to to fire in a raise preflop becomes the preflop aggressor, has the preflop aggression. Um, when, when you have a situation where a player open limps and you call behind that open limper and you got a couple of other people in the pot, um, nobody has a preflop aggression. That happens plenty of times in tournaments. We've seen it happen uh, quite a bit. A lot of times we'll be in the uh, in in a big blind or a small blind. We'll we'll catch a little piece of the flop, and we'll look at it and we'll say, well, no one really has the preflop aggression, so we can't count on a C bet. We fire out instead of uh, uh, waiting for the check raise. We will go. Uh, We'll keep keep on going. And what is a continuation bet? What is C betting? What is continuation betting? Basically, a continuation bet is the uh, the bet you place out after the flop, after the flop, post flop, when you have the pre flop aggression. You know, when when, a, when there is a pre flop aggressor who follows up a flop with a another bet, that's called a continuation bet or the C bet. Basically, you are continuing your pre-flop aggression with the with a bet after the flop, continuing you know continuing that aggression. That is called the continuation bet. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys, it is the most profitable bet in poker, and, and in particular, no limit hold'em poker tournaments uh, is that C bet. And we're going to talk a little bit about why. First off. Let's get to a concept in no limit hold'em tournaments that, uh, if, there, if there's a few things that I want you to take away from today, this is one of them. I want you to think about no limit tournaments as far as uh, spots, not hands. Spots, not hands. Okay, guys, drill that. You know, just memorize that. Spots, not hands. We are not waiting for hands in, in, in no limit hold'em tournaments. We're waiting for spots. We're not looking for the, uh, you know, you know the, the top five percent of, of hands that we can start with. We're looking for the top five percent of spots that we can turn into profitable uh, situations. Uh, let's rewind a little bit. We talked about this, you know, in, in last night's tournament that we ended up with the W in. You know, we ended up winning, coming back from one blind after we got our aces cracked to uh, taking down the whole tournament. And one thing that we did was we looked at the hand history of that tournament. And we, we started looking at how many hands actually went to showdown, how many hands actually had to turn over where people were like, oh, that's what that guy was raising with pre-flop. Oh, that's what, that's what that guy was check raising on, you know, on the flop with. You know, oh, that's what that guy was seed betting with. The, and what we, what we saw... And this is pretty much common across the board in all no limit hold'em tournaments. No matter you know whether you're playing a ten dollar tournament online or a ten thousand dollar tournament at the Rio, what you see in no limit hold'em tournaments is that a very small percentage of the hands actually reach showdown. A very small percentage of the hands actually have to be turned over. And what what we can take from that is that the hands don't matter. If you don't ever have to turn over your hand, then it doesn't matter what you have. You know, what, what matters is the spot you find yourself in. Okay, so drill it into your head, spots, not hands. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just you know, not look at your cards and win a tournament, but then again, maybe it does. We'll talk about that a little bit later in this poker clinic. But let's get back to blind stealing. You know, I, I said before, blind stealing, when it comes to the tools of the, uh, the, the poker practitioner in a no limit hold'em tournament, blind stealing and check, you know, and, and continuation betting are, you know, the, the, the hammer and the screwdriver, tool number one, tool number two. These are the most important tools in the no limit hold'em uh, tournament uh, player's belt. Why do we steal blinds? Okay, so... There's a few reasons why we're, we blind steal. First off, you know, when you make a blind steal, a lot of the time you are able to pick up the blinds and the antes, often without ever even having to see a flop. 
Now, most tournaments, if you once you get into the ante stage, and keep in mind, we don't really steal blinds in No Limit Hold'em tournaments before the antes kick in. Once those antes kick in, a lot of times you're looking at, at these situations where you're able to win you know, 500 tournament chips with a, a 450 or a 500 tournament bet. You know, you're, you're, you're able to, at the 150, 300 level, when it's uh, you know, 25 antes, a lot of times you're able to, to fire out and win you know, 700 tournament chips or, you know, or even more with, you know, a seven or 750 chip bet. So when you're stealing blinds, you don't really have to get away with it that often. You only have, if, if you get away with it, your blind steals 50% of the time, then you're, you're going to be way ahead on them. Uh, but when you actually get looked up and you, and you actually see a flop, well, if you're, if you're blind stealing correctly, a good, a good chunk of the time you're going to start the hand behind but that doesn't really mean that you have any, you know, any less of a chance of connecting with your hand than, you know, than your opponent who's calling, you know, who's calling you in the blind or calling you on the button. Um, and, the, and one of the main reasons why we steal blinds, besides hopefully picking up the blinds and antis without even seeing a flop, is to take that pre-flop aggression to be the pre-flop aggressor and set ourselves up for that most profitable uh, bet in poker, which is the C bet. Now, before we talk about C betting, I want to talk a little bit about pre-flop raise amounts, and I want to talk about tapering. Um, this is you know a, a concept that's been around for a long time. What is tapering? It, it's been around since uh, I, I you know it's kind of newish, kind of in the in the in in the last five or six years, you've kind of seen this idea of tapering happen. I don't know that anyone's ever called it tapering, um, but I'm going to start calling it tapering right now because, you know, basically what is tapering? I mean, outside of poker, tapering basically just means a, a gradual, um, a gradual diminishing of something, right? So something declining over time. Thinking, or you can also kind of think of it as a haircut, right? Tapering, uh, tapering the sides of a haircut. Um, in poker, what I mean by tapering is uh, lowering, lowering your pre-flop raise amount in comparison to the big blind as the blinds and antes increase. So to give you an example, let's say that we're sitting there at the 100-200 level with a 25 ante and we make it 2.5x the big blind. So the whole the whole level, we're going to be keeping our pre-flop raise standard at that amount, 2.5x. Um, but as the blinds get higher, we're going to want to adjust that 2.5x or 3x or whatever our pre-flop raise amount is. We're going to start. We want to start adjusting that downwards. And there's a few reasons why we do that. This is kind of an evolution of uh, of, of tournament strategy. When I when I started in poker tournaments, uh, people would people would basically make it three three and a half four times the big blind all through the tournament, uh, and, and it, it wasn't until about four or five years ago that people started changing their pre flop raise amount based on on the blinds and and it started getting smaller and smaller as the blinds got bigger. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't integrate that into my game until about two years ago. I had some uh, had some friends who were down in uh, in Mexico, up in uh, you know down in Rosarito, and they were telling me that they were having a lot of success with you know lowering their preflop raise amount all the way down to just a min raise preflop, and I, I just couldn't even believe it. I mean, how can you get through with a blind steal making it you know only two x? How can you get through with that min raise? Well. It turns out that you can get through a lot. The reason tapering works is because as the tournament progresses and as the blinds increase, the the effective stack sizes at the table, you know, decrease quite a bit. Once you get to a final table and you're looking around and the average stack is, you know, 20 big blinds, well, making that min raise actually starts putting you know, considerable pressure on somebody who looks down at a non-premium hand in the big blind and thinks, do I really want to put in Five, ten percent of my stack with uh, the old seven three suited. I think not. 
you know, what you find is that the smaller amounts end up being just as effective as a 3x amount. It gets the job done. And what also tends to happen when, you know, and why I think tapering has become so effective and has really taken over as, you know, the dominant correct tournament strategy is that when you lower your preflop raise amount, what ends up happening is that you, you know, opponents that fight you for that blind, opponents that, that resist your blind steal, they end up becoming less invested in the pot. And a lower pot investment by your opponents leads to a higher fold uh, frequency post-flop. You're able to actually get your, your continuation bets to work more often because you don't commit your opponents to the pot. Now keep in mind, the more someone is, you know, has invested into a pot pre-flop and, and post-flop, the less likely, likely they are to fold. Even though we say before, any, any chips that are in the pot aren't yours anymore, psychologically that's not, really, you know, that's not really there. That's not really how it works. When you put in a, a big blind, you're still kind of looking at that big blind as your chips. When you make a call you know, against a pre-flop raiser, you're still looking at you know, the, 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 the chips that you committed to that pot as your chips. Even though you really shouldn't, players do. It's only natural. And the more they commit to that pot, the less likely they are to just give it up. So this is why I think tapering has really been uh, been effective, is because not only are we, you know, not only do smaller raising amounts get through because of the smaller effective stacks of uh, you know, of our opponents and and uh, our own stacks as the blinds and antes increase through a tournament, but you also get that lower pot investment by your opponents and you're able to get that c bet through. Uh, more often, so that that's that's tapering. That is tapering, and that you know it's basically um, you, you want to keep your preflop raises the same in relation to the big blind during that level, right? So as soon as the level increases, you look at the the big blind and you come up with your multiple, and that's going to be your go-to preflop raise amount for that whole level. Um, but as the levels increase as the effective stacks in the tournament decrease. You're going to want to also decrease that multiple until you're making a, a straight minimum raise. And that is tapering in a nutshell. Now sometimes we're going to deviate from that. Okay, Sometimes we don't uh, stick with that whole idea of you know, 2 point, you know, 2x, 2.1x, and eventually 2x. And when do we deviate from our preflop raising uh, our standard preflop raise amounts, our standard preflop bet sizing. Well, we, we deviate when the effective stacks are, are such that it doesn't make sense anymore to make it 2x. And I'll give you an example. Let's say that, you know, the, the simplest example is you look down and you have six big blinds in front of you. Well, with that kind of stack, it doesn't make sense anymore to make a 2x big blind preflop raise. Instead, you're going to want to just shove your whole stack in. Um, now, if it doesn't make sense, if you're looking at six big blinds to make the standard preflop raise, uh, what if you have 30 big blinds and you're in the small blind or the button and the, your opponent's left that you're making your blind steal against only have six big blinds? Well, this is what we call effective stacks. What this basically means is you, you treat your own stack, no matter how deep it is, you treat it only as big as your opponent's stack. So if you're in the small blind and the big blind has eight big blinds or seven big blinds, and you look down and you see a hand that you should be raising with, you, you might as well go ahead and just shove your whole stack in and treat your stack as if it was a six big blind or seven big blind stack. Okay, so that's pretty much when we deviate uh, from that preflop raise amount. Other than that, you pretty much want to go ahead and keep your, your, uh, your preflop raise amount standard during a certain level and generally taper off as the blinds and antis go up. So now let's talk about, let's get back to um, you know, the, the follow-up with that blind steal, which is the C-bet the continuation bet, the most valuable, profitable bet in all of poker. <sighs> Why is it important to see bet? Well, 
The main reason why it's important to see bet is because most of the time you both miss. Let's let's run some numbers really quick. Let's just imagine, for example, that you've got ace queen off suit. Well, what are the chances that you actually hit hit a pair on the flop? What are the chances that with your ace queen off suit you hit a queen or you hit an ace? The the chances are actually not that good. They're about one in three. Now let's say that you're you're making that blind steal and, and and before we before we talk about you know before we talk about this let's let's go back to the blind steal really quick and let's talk about just how rare is it how rare is it to have a uh, you know have pocket queens or better ace king aces kings queens that doesn't happen a lot we're we're looking at between 2 and 3% of the time so when you're on the in the small blind or the button you know, or the cutoff, and you make a blind steal, the chances of your opponents actually you know, waking up with a monster, it just doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot. So, you know, when they do call you, most of the time they're calling you with uh, a, a non-monster type hand, the, the, kind of, the kind of hands that we think of like queen 10 off suit, pocket threes. I mean, they're, they're going to wake up with... Uh, they're going to wake up with you know, a pocket pair some of the time, uh, but but not often. Most of the time, they're going to be calling you with uh, a non-paired hand, and most of the time when the flop comes, they're going to miss, and you're going to miss. Both of you are going to miss. That's just how poker works. You 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 make the blind steal, you know, you, they defend against it, and you both miss. And this is why the continuation bet is so important because what ends up happening is 66% of the time they don't make their pair and you're able to continue with that pre-flop aggression and take the pot down for less than a half pot size bet you know you're able to invest we'll say 500 chips to win a thousand chips and that works more than 50% of the time it's an incredible value you guys so let's talk about reasons not to see bet because I, I, I think this is one of the biggest mistakes you get um, that, that, that you see in poker tournaments, in no limit hold'em poker tournaments, is players getting up this seabed opportunity. And there's a lot of reasons why people come up with why it's it's not a good idea to seabed. Um, they they say, well, uh, you're up against multiple opponents. It's a scary board that crushes the other guy's range. Um, the other guy's a calling station. Of course, he's he's going to call me. I'm sure he's going to call me. Uh, the, the the truth is, you guys, there's not a lot of reasons not to see bet. We're going to take a take a break here for one second and take a look at the uh, questions. the questions. And what what kind of questions do you think that we've got X and Y that we need to address? Um, Polarize had a question. Um, also, you should also probably put the updates, the alerts up so we can see just in case the Twitch alerts isn't working in the chat, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're not, uh, it's, it's going to be like, we're not really going to try to deviate too much from the presentation, you guys. If you, if you, if you subscribe during the session, um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, let me, I'll, I'll email you afterwards and we'll, we'll get all sorted out, but uh, I'm really going to just try to make this kind of a, a very low-key presentation for you guys and uh, because we're going to take this put it on youtube try to incorporate it into into future uh you know learning materials and whatnot okay and polarize had a question about a hand so polarize asks us uh is he asking about this jay carver's hand uh, jc's uh, let's see, yes. what do you think of jc's 4x to 7x do you think that the increased fold equity could ever outweigh the amount of big blinds lost when you get reshoved on um Polarize. I, I I don't really, I don't I don't really know what example you're talking about. What I do think is that, you know, if if you have a normal stack size and a normal stack size, we're going to define as 20 big blinds or more, and your opponents have a normal stack size of 20 big blinds or more, then I think that overbetting the uh, the pot, uh, you know, in, in that kind of situation, making it four times the big blind to seven times the big blind doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, of course, you are going to get more fold equity, but 
you know, when you're making that blind steal, if, if someone's going to call, if someone's going to call a two and a half times a big blind raise or a three times a big blind raise, um, you know, I, I guess more people, you know, you're a lot more likely to get through with a seven x big blind, you know, pre flop raise than you are a two x for sure. But one of the main reasons why you're making it that you know small is to set yourself up for you know successful continuation bets. If someone calls a seven x big blind. Uh, you're just not going to really be able to get them off post flop, and I feel like I feel like seven x, six x, five x, four x is just too much. I think that uh, you know if I, I, two and a half does the trick, you get you, you, your fold equity doesn't really change that much, and you're putting a lot of chips at risk. So uh, I, I don't I don't like over betting uh, pre flop. Just really don't. So. Uh, Hip ain't cheap says I play six maxes a lot and I miss so much in C bet and get and get called by so many people on draws. Then I'm su- I'm stuck and can't go on. And I've invested a nice amount. You know, good regulars will try to outplay you like that. And hip ain't cheap. You're right. Good good regular players. Good players are going to see. Oh wow, this guy's C betting percentages. His post flop aggression is way off the charts. It's it's close to a hundred percent. So I'm going to do stuff like I'm going to try to outplay him here. I'm going to check raise when I, you know, I'm I'm never donk leading. I'm check raising when I when I actually hit. I'm definitely check raising some hands that I completely miss, and you know, for that hip ain't cheap. I I would just point out that, you know, you're going to have to get really comfortable. Uh, if if you want to have extended, no limit hold'em tournament success, you're going to have to get very comfortable playing post flop, and a big part of that is being able to recognize when someone's just playing back at you. Uh, when someone check raises you with air, and a lot of times you're going to you know, implement other tools that you've got, like you know, in- inducing bluffs and uh, making very very thin calls. If, if someone check raises you, you know, and in your continuation betting, a hundred percent of the time, and now you get check raised, and you and you actually do, you know, you actually are able to connect with the flop, and you've got bottom pair or weak kicker you got to be you got to be ready to you know commit yourself with those kind of hands if you completely whiff and you've got you know ace high or even king high you've got to be willing to make those real real thin calls uh, and and play back when you realize that a, a player is trying to take advantage and exploit what they see as you know a, a, a higher level of aggression than they think is optimal but I'm going to tell you guys, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in the future, like later on in this poker clinic session, Hip Ain't Cheap. We're going to talk about the idea behind game theory optimal versus exploit of play. And I'm going to suggest to you guys that you know, GTO, game theory optimal play in no limit hold'em tournaments, is to continuation bet a very, very high percentage of the time. Now, you know, GTO might not be 100% of the time. But it's a lot closer to 100 than it is to zero. And the idea behind GTO, but behind Game Theory Optimal, is that if you are playing optimally, then you're not going to be at a point you know, where someone can really exploit you. you know, even if someone counters your strategy, you're still, you're, you're still going to be able to get the, most, you know, the, the highest EV that you can. And uh, there's not really a good counter to... You know, a, a high post flop uh, uh, aggression. There's not really a good counter to uh, a, a high C bet. What are you going to do? You're basically faced with, you know, trying to outplay that opponent by check raising and by you know making really really light calls. Most of the time, you're going to be in the big blind or the small blind and out of position when you do it. You know, put yourself in their spot and realize that, you know. And we'll, in a future poker clinic, we're going to talk about implicit collusion. We're going to talk about the jungle rule because that's another big part of this. Realize that when you're in their spot and they're looking around and, and thinking, okay, well, you know, Hip Ain't Cheap is sitting here and he, he's doing a lot of blind stealing. He's opening very light. I know it, so I should three bet him more. And he's, uh, his continuation betting is just off the charts. His post-flop aggression is super high, so I should check raise him more. Um, Keep in mind that when they when they're playing against you like that, they're they're giving up on opportunities to to attack the weaker spots at the table because the weakest spots at a no limit hold'em table are the guys who are just waiting for their cards, aren't 
caring about the spots. They're, you know, getting folded to the button. And if they don't have, you know, you know, two court cards or pocket pairs or suited connections, if they if they don't have a hand that's like in their top 25, 30 percent range, they're never raising those blinds. You know, those are the weak spots that you want to be going after. You want to go after the the guys who, you know, raise pre-flop and then don't continuation bet. You know, you want to be going after the guys who, uh, you know, call their big blind and then don't play back at you unless they, they fit the, the flop. And, and hip eight and cheap, you're right. You, good regs will try to outplay you. Of course, they're, they're going to try to outplay you. But also keep in mind that, you know, at, you as a player need to be going after the, uh, you need to be going after the bony fish. When you're making blind steals, if, if you have a shark next to a, a player's name and you, you're like, oh, wow, that guy knows what he's doing. You know, B. Shriver, wow, that guy's good. He's good. Butters, you know, he's good. He's got this shark. And if, he, if it's his big blind, and I'm sitting here, you know, uh, in the cutoff or the button or the hijack, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to try to steal Butters' blind, a lot of times I'm going to be giving up on that blind steal opportunity leading to the seabed opportunity just because he's a good enough player that I'm going to expect that he's going to try to play back. I mean, I don't really feel like getting into confrontations with other good players at the table. You're going after the bony fish. So, you know, that's kind of part of the, you know, part of it hip ain't cheap. And we'll talk about the jungle rule and implicit collusion in a later poker clinic. Um, but hopefully that, that gets to your, uh, that gets to your, you know, your issue. It doesn't, you know, just because you feel like you're getting outplayed doesn't mean that you should stop stealing blinds and stop continuation betting. Those, I'm telling you, are the two most important tools in a no limit hold'em tournament player's arsenal. Those are the ways that those two things are 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 the most important things. They're, they're, those are the ways that you win poker tournaments. So you can't stop doing it just because you feel like you're getting outplayed. The only thing you can really do is you know try to outplay them post flop or stay away from players who you feel like can outplay you. That's really the only thing you can do. Because if you stop, you know, if you don't see bet and you give up those blind stealing uh, opportunities, hip ain't cheap, you're going to be this guy. You're going to be basically just be um, burning money you know, every single time you enter into a tournament. So don't give up those blind stealing opportunities. Don't give up those see bet opportunities. Okay. Good, good to see you, big dog pocket fives. So, I want to I want to talk a little bit about why people uh, say not to see bet. One of the big reasons that people say you know don't want to see bet is because of that scary board. They say, well, it's such a scary wet board. Of course, it crushed their range, and and I can understand that, right? But I want to, you know, uh, you know we, we talk about a couple of. Uh, you know, a, a couple of takeaways from today. One of those, you know, takeaways, you know, I want you to drill in your head is that whole idea of spots, not hands. But this is the second thing I want you to take away from it, uh, from this poker clinic, and it's this. If the flop scares you, it scares them too. You know, don't let a scary flop keep you from making that seat bet against, a, a, against your opponent heads up. Keep in mind that whatever the flop is, and you're looking at it, and you're, it's the scariest flop in the world, it doesn't matter. A lot of times they're, they're going to have completely whiffed it, or they're going to have a, a weaker than average hand, and it scares them just as much as it scares you. So don't give up that opportunity to see bet. You know, if the flop comes out, 9-10 jack, you know, all spades, and you're sitting there with the old 7-5 of hearts that you had tried to make a blind steal with, just recognize that a lot of times you're going to be able to get better to fold with that C bet. There's no way. There's no way that pocket sevens calls you when you make that. You know when you make a when you fire into that that kind of wet board. There's no way that like ace three suited calls you when you fire into that wet board. You're going to be able to get better hands to fold. So drill that into your head, tattoo it on your arm, and don't give up that that post flop C bet just because it's a scary flop when your head's up. I'm going to tell you guys pretty much the only reason why I think it's it's right not to see bet is when you're up against multiple opponents. Now, we talk about how most of the time your opponents are going to miss the flop and most of the time you're going to miss the flop too. Well, once you're up against multiple opponents, all of a sudden that really drops down. Um, you know, you're you're looking at 
basically parlaying. So let's say that you know 33 percent of the time, you know this guy hits 60 percent, uh, you know 66 percent of the time, two out of three he doesn't. Um, well, once you start having two and three and four opponents, you're basically parlaying that 66 percent. So the chances of both opponents missing. Uh, it basically, it's it's a parlay, 66 square, you know, 66 percent squared. This is kind of, you know, kind of simplifying it because the, the chances that all of your opponents missing a flop are actually it's not independent, right? Uh, a lot of times they're going to have the same type of hands. So if a flop comes out like you know seven five two, it's a lot more likely that all of them miss their hand. You know, all things aren't equal. If you know, a lot of times they're going to have court cards, court cards, court cards, they're all going to have each other's out. So they're not independent result, you know, they're not actually independent chances. But the point is, the only reason I think that is legitimate in an online situation or a live situation where you don't have any sort of tells on your opponents to not make that C-bet post-flop when you have the pre-flop aggression against a heads-up opponent is if you have multiple you know, is, is if you have multiple opponents if you're not heads up um, let's also talk a little bit about live versus online you know there are, there definitely exists checking tells right and this is another thing that you'll see pe you know people say is I'm, I'm not going to bet here you know I'm gonna check behind here because I'm sure that I'm gonna get check raised um, live sometimes that works you know live sometimes you're looking at an opponent and you know, he, 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 he'll check in a certain way where you're, you're sure he's going for the check raise. Um, online, sometimes, you know, he'll, he'll check very quickly and you're like, I know that he's going to, ch you know, check raise because he checked so quickly. You know, the main thing I would say here is don't mug yourself when you're trying to find these tells, especially online. There's not really tells online. The kind of timing tells that you would expect to have online, oftentimes, the guy, the guy's multi-tabling. Oftentimes, the guy's you know checking his email, checking his phone, watching the television. You can't really put a lot of uh, a, a lot of stock into any sort of you know timing tells online. But as far as as far as live tells go, just make sure you don't mug yourself because all too often I see somebody come up with the reason that they're not going to see bet in a spot because they were pretty sure the guy was going to check raise and they're just wrong. They end up leveling themselves. Um, there's just so let's talk a little bit about how much to see bet, okay? Um, just like your pre-flop raise amounts, you want to keep those standard. You also pretty much want to keep your see bet standard. Um, and my general rule of thumb is when you're in position against uh, you know your opponent heads up, you you, you just repeat your pre-flop raise. So this basically is going to happen if uh, you know if, if someone open limps or someone raises and you three bet or uh, or you, you you make that preflop raise and a, a blind calls. And I think that my rule of thumb is just to repeat uh, you know repeat the preflop raise amount that you made it to to claim the preflop aggression. Uh, out of position or multi way, my rule of thumb is half pot. If I'm up against multiple opponents and I'm making the seabed against multiple opponents, I'll, I'll generally make it half pot. If I'm out of position, that, that is, I try to go for a blind steal, I get, I get called on the button or the cutoff. Um, I'll, I, I'll also make it half pot just because I, I, wanted to make it, I want to make it a little bit more expensive for the person to continue with the hand um, and force me to play out of position. Uh, I'm going to talk about exceptions and experiments to this. right? I think uh, exceptions to this are definitely going to be when, when the when the effective stack sizes are are less than than you know 20 bigs so a lot of times your c bet it, it doesn't really make sense to 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 c bet the same amount if you're going to be leaving your you know if 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 the if the, if your preflop raise amount was you know 2x or 2.5x and now by c betting that same 2 2x 2.5x you're giving your your opponent like four big blinds behind, a, a, a lot of times those kind of bets don't really make sense. So if if the effective stack sizes seem lower than you know 20 big blinds or 15 big blinds, you might want to go ahead and adjust your C betting um, and basically just make it a shove instead of instead of a normal C bet. 
You can also experiment a little bit. Um, this is kind of something that uh, I, I talked to Kyle Lohman about, and uh, it, it kind of makes sense. You might want to experiment a little bit with your, your C-bet sizing and size your continuation bet more based on your opponent's stack size. You know, keep in mind that if you, you know, later on in the tournament when the effective stack sizes are small, if you make a raise against someone's big blind and they've got 15 big blinds, you, you can often get away with a C-bet that's even less than your preflop raise amount. So, uh, you know, go ahead and, you know, go ahead and think about that. One thing I do want to kind of drill down on that, uh, a third concept I got, I want you guys to take away from this is when you're, when you're looking at these, you know, blind steals followed by a C bet, you can almost kind of think of, think of it as kind of a one, two punch, right? Um, but you don't want to be going after players who feel like they have nothing to lose. You also don't want to be going after players who have, been losing a lot of their stack and might be looking down at it and feeling like, um, you know, feeling like they're short when they're not. We call these stacks drowning stacks. And again, you know, this is just another one of those pieces of poker advice that I came up with kind of rhymes and, and it works. Don't attack a drowning stack. If you are looking at the table and you see a drowning stack, you can pretty much stay away from, you know, stealing their blind because they're going to be you know, they're, they're, they're gasping for air. They're looking for any sort of out. And they're going to be bringing you down with them. So uh, don't attack a drowning stack. Okay, so before we go on to a little bit of GTO, a little bit of exploitive play, let's see if we've got any other questions that we need to address. And it is good to see you all, all of our subscribers. Thank you so much. And good to see you too, Big Dog Pocket Fives. Very, very cool to... Uh, very cool to to see some other streamers in the uh, in the chat uh, listening into our poker clinic. So let's talk a little bit about game theory optimal versus exploitive play. First off, what is game theory? Right. Well, I mean, game theory basically it came out uh, back in the fifties or forties. You got John von Neumann. You got a couple of uh, you know mathematics. It's a branch of mathematics which basically looks you know, it looks at the way we make decisions. You know, it, it assumes a lot. It, one of the things it assumes is that we're all rational thinkers, that we're all trying to maximize, you know, our value. It doesn't really take into account the irrationality of people. Uh, it doesn't take into account the guy, you know, who's like the Mark Wahlberg or, or uh, you know, James Kahn character in The Gambler who sits down at the poker table and actively wants to lose because he enjoys to feel the pain, right? But uh, basically, game theory is the study of strategic decision-making. I mean, that's straight off of Wikipedia. You know, the study of strategic decision-making, basically looking at mathematical models and, uh, you know, looking at, looking at the way rational thinkers make decisions Assuming that other participants in you know in the uh, in the game uh, are also rational thinkers trying to do the same kind of thing, and you know game theory isn't about you know tiddly winks and chess and poker. Game theory you know uh, apply you know, game theory treats you know most of the, you know situations where you're where you're trying to make a decision as a game. You know the uh, the the definition of a game in game theory. You know, it doesn't really have anything to do with uh, you know what you and I might think of as a game, like a board game, like Monopoly or chess or bridge or whatever. Um, they 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 look at like you know if if you are a if you are a, a bartender and you own a bar across the street from another bartender who also owns a bar, right? And you're trying to think about you know how much to price your you know your martinis at. Well, that's a game. In their mind, you know, if if you're a prisoner, I mean, we take the prisoner's dilemma, which is the, the, the classic um, example of game theory, and, and we'll we're going to be talking about game theory in some future poker clinics, you guys. So don't worry too much about all of this. But you know, the the, the prisoner's dilemma is basically you've got two prisoners who committed a crime together, and they get caught and they get pulled into the uh, you know the in interrogation room separately, and they're both given a, basically a plea deal where if if both of you don't talk, you're both going to do two years. But if one of you talks and one of you, you know, doesn't talk, um, the, the one who doesn't talk is going to do 20 years. And, you know, if you both talk, then you both do two, you know, 10 years. 
it, 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 these kind of prison, you know, the, the prisoner's dilemma is that classic game theory case, right? Well, game theorists basically treat that as a game, you know, and, you know, if, if you've ever been in an interrogation room, I'm sure there was nothing game-like about it. So the idea is, math, you know, the, the, the name game doesn't really have anything to do with real, you know, games as you and I would see it. Um, but poker is a type of game studied under game theory, and it's, it's what's known as a combinatorial game of incomplete information. So you've got games like chess, where everything is open and it's a game of complete information. Tic-tac-toe is a game of complete information. Um, poker is a game of incomplete information. Not only do you not know what your opponents have, but there's also a randomness element, like backgammon. Backgammon, I'm pretty sure, is also a game of incomplete information because even though you know, uh, you know what the position is and you know, uh, you know what the chances are of everything, I'm pretty sure that the element of, of I think we're gonna we're gonna look at. It. I gotta I gotta brush up a little bit on this, but anyway, the point is, poker is basically studied under game theory. We can uh, we can uh, kind of think about game theory and, and exploitive play. Let's, let's get some other, uh, other concepts because this is an idea that you'll hear a lot. Game theory optimal. So basically when people talk about game theory optimal in terms of poker, GTO uh, is what they, uh, you know, they're, they're making it short for. It's, it's this theoretical strategy which is going to give you the, uh, the biggest ROI, the biggest EV, assuming your opponent plays perfectly against you. So think about GTO like this. Uh, basically, it's the strategy that a, a perfect computer opponent would play. So if you're up against that perfect computer opponent, that, 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 that robot AI guy, um, you're not going to be able to exploit him, even though you know exactly how he plays. You know, he sits there and he gives you this long printout, this long instruction sheet that shows you every single situation that he could possibly find himself in and how he will play. Even when he gives you that, you're looking at it and you're like, well, I'm not actually going to be able to, to exploit you in any way. Uh, that's basically what GTO is. Game theory optimal. Okay? Yep? I just want to mention that Donkey Pro subscribed and Santiago um, Donkey Pro subscribe was going to subscribe yesterday if you won that tournament. Oh, <laughs> Donkey Pro yeah. Santagro, thank you guys for the subs. Um, we're we're going to try to do. Uh, we we would normally give you a, a much better welcome after this. Uh, after this poker clinic is done, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, shoot you guys some emails. And I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, so thank you guys and Bombs Thirteen. Thank you, thank you guys for uh, for the subscription. So let's compare GTO. Okay, Bombs Thirteen just. Yep. Thank you guys so much. Uh, sorry for the uh, the lackluster welcome to the crew and the, the subscription spiel. Um, trying to take this poker clinic and you know wrap it up. I don't want to. I don't want to have to do you know edit too much out of it when we're trying to you know export it to YouTube. Uh, let's let's get back to game theory. Let's get back to GTO versus exploitive play. So exploitive is basically any sort of strategy which tries to get a, a bigger edge than GTO would. Uh, would provide based on the mistakes of your opponents. So let's give an example, and uh, let's 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 say what this means for what we're talking about. Uh, so I want you to think about that that perfect computer opponent again, that perfect AI guy who you know has the the game theory optimal strategy for no limit hold'em tournaments, multi-table no limit hold'em tournaments. I'm telling you guys, this. This is not only you know possible and probable. It, it's probably I mean it's probably going to happen. We're probably going to get to a point in the future, not too far into the future, where uh, a, a computer uh, a, a computer opponent is going to be able to beat any uh, any human opponent. That's probably going to happen. We're probably going we're all, we're probably already there for limit hold'em. Uh, there's been a lot of AI research coming out of like uh, you know University of Calgary up in Alberta. Uh, if you if you look at the, like the scholarly journals and the and the white papers and you look at uh, every year they have like a, a 
uh, a world series of, of artificial intelligence, basically the world series of bots. We've talked about bots in our, in our, um, you know, in our streams before. We're probably already at the point where, you know, and where AI has gotten to the point where a computer program can beat any human opponent in a limit hold'em situation. Heads up! I think we've already gotten to that point. Um, as far as no limit hold'em heads up, I don't think that that's been you know solved uh, for you know a game theory optimal solution. Uh, but it, I think it will be, and I think that if if a if a heads up no limit hold'em solution exists, then we're probably going to be looking at multi-table tournaments, no limit hold'em solutions. I don't think it's going to be. I, don't, I really don't think it's too far off, and I think that it's inevitable. I think that eventually we are going to get to the point where you put the best poker players in the world, the Phil Helmuth, the Dan Coleman's, the Daniel Negreanu's, and you put them in a, a situation where they're up against a hundred. Um, you know, computer opponents who are all playing you know, game theory optimal strategy, and they're just going to get their asses handed to them. I, I really think that we're at that point. You know, we're going to get to that point. Uh, but let's look at exploitive play in GTO, and let's, in particular, I want you to think about what it means for the C bet. What it means for what we were just talking about about blind stealing and continuation betting. Because I'm going to tell you guys when when we think about how often you should be c-betting and how often you should be blind stealing we, we really should be trying to go for that that gto play we really should be trying to model our own game um, after that game theory optimal you know theoretically perfect way to play these multi-table tournaments rather than trying to exploit our, our our players so much because if we're if we're playing gto if we're playing game theory optimally then we're always going to have that edge. We're always going to have an edge against our opponents. They're not going to be able to exploit us. And all too often, when I see players changing their frequencies of blind stealing, changing their frequencies of seed betting, um, based on you know uh, this this idea of exploiting their opponent's mistakes, all too often I see them just leveling themselves and giving up profitable c bet you know situations because they're sure that the guy's a calling station giving up uh profitable blind stealing situations because they're sure that the guy's you know calling too much um and so i want you to think about when that day comes where you know the 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 datas of the world are you know on the star you know on the enterprise and they're playing multi table tournaments with everybody and just crushing it except for riker i guess uh, I want you to think about how often you think that perfect computer opponent, that perfect GTO opponent, would be seed betting. Because I guarantee you, even though that 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 seed bet percentage is, isn't going to be anywhere near a hundred percent, it's going to be closer to a hundred than it is to zero. I promise you that. When it comes out, it's going to be closer to a hundred, you know, than zero. Just like when you're playing heads up against one of these GTO machines, they raise their button. Closer to 100% than 0%. Um, it, it's going to be the same thing with the C bet. I'm absolutely sure of it. I'd be willing to stake, uh, you know, stake the roll on it. So, you know, for your own C betting percentages, your own follow throughs with those blind steals, um, stick with that GTO. You know, that's where you really want to go for. You really want to try to be playing optimally, not exploitively. Um, because when you play exploitively, you end up just leveling yourself. Go for that edge that you know that you're going to have, rather than trying to uh, adjust your game and play suboptimally against a perfect opponent. Uh, keep that that post flop aggression. Let's talk a little bit about some exercises I want you guys to try. I can't tell you how hard it is to when you're when you're first starting out with this whole idea of you know of, of spots not hands when you're when you're first starting out with this idea of c betting with whatever you know comes on the flop i can't tell you how hard it is to look down at a hand like 5-2 off suit in the cutoff and think this is a good spot um, it's very easy to be you know especially in live you know you're dealt your hand you don't look at it until it's your turn it's very easy in live situations to 
uh, look and say, you know what, this is a, probably a pretty good spot for a raise here. This is a good spot for a blind steal. This is a good spot for a three bet against that guy who I think is opening light. And then you look down at your hand and you see absolute garbage. Absolute napkins. And all of a sudden it doesn't feel like a good spot anymore. So you fold. This happens all the time. I mean, I can't tell you how often I see it in tournaments. And you know, for the longest time, it, you know, it, it, was, it was my game too. Uh, I'd try to see spots. I'd try not to be dependent on my cards. I would try to go for spots, not hands. But then when you know, I, I would see the spot, I wouldn't take the spot because I'd look at the hand and, and chicken out. Keep in mind what we talked about. You know, no Limit Hold'em tournaments is not a game of showdowns. Your hand doesn't matter. And so how do you get comfortable with looking down at complete trash, complete garbage, you got Big Dog Pocket Fives in chat. He does this all the time, right? You see him do this all the time where you, he'll think someone's you know, opening, uh, opening light and he'll make a, a, you know, a three bet you know, on, on the button or you know, in the cutoff with like complete air, 10-5 off suit, and you know, follow up with that C bet. And when he gets played back, he'll make these crazy float plays. How does he get comfortable doing that? Well, I don't know. But what I do, what I do know is this. There are some things that you can do to get comfortable doing it. You, there are some things that you can do which you can you know, start realizing that your cards don't matter. And one of the exercises that I would suggest you try is to actually go for that Annette Oberstad accomplishment of playing and winning a No Limit Hold'em tournament without ever looking at your cards. If there's you know, not a finer display of this whole idea that cards don't matter in no limit hold'em tournaments. I don't I don't know what it is. Um, if you can, you know, if, if the next time you're playing a tournament that doesn't matter that much to you, just give it a try. Instead of, you know, instead of trying to, you know, see your spot and saying this is a good spot and then looking down and chickening out. Well, if it's a good spot and it doesn't matter what you have, then don't even look. The cards are just going to get in the way. You're going to say, you know what, I'm going to make this blind steal no matter what I have. Uh, except that, you know, I can't, it, that happens. So try it as an exercise. Try to play a sit and go or try to play a live tournament without ever looking at your cards. Now, the chances are, I mean, pretty likely you're going to get knocked out. But the chances are pretty likely you're going to get knocked out anyway. I mean, the in the money percentage is pretty small for these no limit and oldham tournaments. And that kind of exercise is going to get you comfortable with the idea that cards don't matter. It's going to get you comfortable with the idea that you can raise with, with nothing. And once you start getting comfortable you know, acting on those spots and not waiting for hands, then you're going to be okay looking at the 5-2 offsuit and thinking, it doesn't matter what I have. Once you realize that it truly doesn't. Once you get away with some blind steals and get away with some C bets where you don't even know what you were raising with, it's going to instill the confidence in you that what I'm telling you is, is, is right. What I'm telling you is true. It doesn't matter what you have in these No Limit Hold'em tournaments. We were looking for spots, not hands. So uh, lastly, I want to just end with one of the most important things that we, we keep on talking about and we keep on drilling and we keep on going over. Uh, the quickest way to get that bony fish is uh, just never, never, never open limp. Um, you know, it's so important not to open limp, especially when those antis hit because you're completely giving up on all the reasons why you blind steal. You're giving up on any equity you can get without a flop. You're giving up that post flop, you know, you're giving up that pre-flop aggression and giving up the opportunity to make that most profitable C bet. So uh, that that is our poker clinic, you guys. Poker clinic session number 2. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and take some questions. So, what do you guys think? You got uh, you got any ideas there? Big dog pocket fives or dodgy double o seven? We went to for dinner. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut it down. I'm gonna come back and put it on a delay. I think we're probably gonna play some tournaments uh, here in a little bit. Well, uh, so I have them ask questions. Though. But if there are any questions, I'm sure there are. Yeah, if there are any questions, please, uh, you know. Now's your time. Now's your time to ask. 
Uh, we are on no delay this time. Okay, so, and we had some new subscribers, right? right? I guess uh, we can go ahead and give them the spiel now. Thank you so much for subscribing. Uh, I can't tell you how much it means to us. And for you, you new subscribers, we're going to go ahead and hook you up with that DRM free copy of Poker Tilt. I'm going to tell you guys. Uh, That's a good question. What are we looking for when we're looking for a good spot? What are we looking for when we look for a good spot, asks Barbecue Kid 8. Basically what you're looking for is a big blind um, who doesn't defend his big blind, who, you know, who, whose VPIP is pretty low and his, his blind defense percentage is pretty low. And in particular, you're looking for uh, players who are going to be fit or, fit, uh, you know, fit or fold opponents. So if you, can get, if, you, if you can get against an opponent who is not going to be playing back at you unless he has a hand that he connects, the flop, you know, connects to the flop, uh, those are the kind of spots you're looking for. You're also looking for spots where someone's uh, raising pre-flop that you might be able to three bet. Uh, and uh, if you if you think that they're raising you know way too liberally, if their VPIP is just off the charts, if you know they're raising 25, 30 percent of their hands, um, the, those three bet spots come up quite a bit. You're also looking for squeeze spots where you've got a couple of open limpers who are making that mistake of open limping that you can. Um, you know, fire out a pot size bet or uh, fire out your pre-flop raise amount plus the open limps and try to, you know, but mainly you're, you're, you're looking for situations that you can get it heads up. That's, that's one of the keys here. Um, you're, you're really, you know, barbecue kid, the, the spots that are going, that you're really going to be looking for are the spots where you can get it, uh, where you can take a flop against one opponent where you're going to be heads up with the pre-flop aggression. Those are the spots you're looking for. Uh, the Bob Hatter says, what percentage of the time do you think your C-bet gets, uh, you know, gets raised? Like, like check raised, I assume you, say, you, you mean, Bob Hatter. And I would say for me, I think that I, think I get check raised ah, about 35, 40% of the time when I C-bet. Um, maybe more, maybe 45, 50% of the time. But think about this for a second, Bob Hatter. Let's say that, let's say that your C-bet gets check raised half the time um, and maybe like or, or let's say it gets either check raised or called half the time that that means that you know 50 percent of the time it gets through the fact is that you're betting you know most of the time when you're C betting you're betting you know half pot or less uh, if it gets through you know even close to half the time it's an insanely profitable bet we'll talk a little bit more about uh, you know the like the uh, you know, we'll have whole poker clinic sessions on probability and you know you know ROI and expected value and, and and what kind of percentages you need that to get through but if you can you know if you get check raised or called on your C bets 50% of the time which is probably high because they're going to completely whiff it uh, more than 50% of the time but if you're making it a half pot size bet or less uh, for your C bet and you, you get check raised 40% of the time and you get called another 20% of the time, it's still going to be just incredibly, um, incredibly profitable for you. And don't forget that sometimes when you get check raised and sometimes when you get played back at, you actually crush the flop. You know, that, that's, not, you know that's not completely out of the question. So um, don't give up on those C bets, guys. Uh, Ira Gary, Ira Gary, when a C bet is called, how often should I double barrel the turn or just check fold? It's a good question, Ira Gary. And uh, this is really when feel and you know player dependent behavior comes in. You, I generally, if I get called or if if I if I have my uh, my, my continuation bet get called, I, I generally. I, I'm much much less likely to fire out a, just a a cold um, you know, a, a, a cold stone cold bluff uh, second barrel and third barrel but sometimes it happens and, you know sometimes the, the the flop is such and the turn is such that the turn is just so scary for what you you're kind of putting them on basically you gotta you gotta put them on a hand what are they calling you with what are they check raising you with you know a, a flop like um, four four three for example someone checks to you and you fire out a, a, a C bet and they call, 
Well, a lot of times they're just going to have overcards. A lot of times they're going to just say, well, uh, I've got overcards. I think that it's probably going to be good. So, you know, on, on the turn, now it comes out like, uh, you know, a, another three. So it's four, four, three, three. A, a lot of times I'm not really looking at that as a, a good card for me to continue with because now they're probably going to be calling me with, you know, ace high all the way down. And if, uh, if they don't have ace high, though, they'll give it up. You really just kind of, it's very player dependent. It's very flop dependent. And there's no real good, you know, rule of thumbs for if you get called, you know, what percentage of the time do you, you know, you know continue with the drive with, this, with that, you know, second and third bullet on the turn in the river. It's not really a good rule of thumb there. The, you know, the, the general rule of thumb here to take, though, is fire out that C bet, you know, and, and worry about it later. You know, you, you could probably, it's still probably even going to be profitable for you if, if your, you know, if your turn bet percentage is zero and your river bet percentage is zero. If you never follow up a C bet that gets called uh, with a second and a third bullet, if you just never do it, it's still going to be a profitable bet for you. So don't give up that opportunity to C bet. Um, We'll say Poker Rat. Dutch, can you also give poker clearance for cash games? Uh, yeah, Poker Rat, I, I can. I'm going to go ahead and do some. You know, I'm going to do a lot of these poker clinics, you guys. I'm going to try to you know, pull them out every single Saturday. And you, they're basically for you subscribers. So if you guys have some you know, questions and things that you want to uh, you know, want to talk about and address in a future poker clinic, by all means, let me know. And uh, I will put it on the agenda. I will put it on the curriculum. Um, yeah, guys, I I know what I know what you're going through. You know, the, the the fact that you're you're here on the stream, you know, hopefully hopefully it's very entertaining, but I I also know that like a big part of the reason why you're here is cuz you want to get better at poker. You know, I know what you're going through because I'm there. I was there, I am there. We're all trying to improve our game. You know, I know what you want. You want to get better results at poker. Everybody does. You know, whether you're a winning player or a losing player, uh, and I'm going to be here to help you get those things. So thank you so much for your subscribes. Thank you, new subscribers. I really appreciate the new subscribers. Fist bump. Welcome to the crew. And we're going to ship you that DRM free copy of Poker Tilt. All of our subscribers get it. Uh, just one of the, the many sub perks that we're trying to roll out. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and shut the poker clinic down. And... Uh, I think so. If you guys have other... Did you see that got pizza? <laughs> nice job, Papist. No, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. Nice job, Papist. Uh, and guys, Where thank you so it? much. Justin's Roy asks, Hey Dutch, off-topic question. During larger multi-table tournaments, I tend to look at number of players, my stack versus theirs, and the average. Should I not care so much about number of players until I get closer to the money and just try to play the best poker I can? Or should I always keep track of where I am versus the average rest of the field? Justin's Roy, that's a great question. And I would say that you should act, you should actually actively not look at how many players are left in the tournament if you can help it. I mean, you're going to get to a point in the tournament where, um, you know, once the bubble starts approaching, you need to know. Uh, but w when you're in a massive field like the Colossus is going to be or the main event, one of the secrets to doing well in a field like that is to, you know, basically... Try to imagine your table as if you're you know, floating in a bubble in space and there's nothing around you except your table. Because it doesn't matter how big the tournament is. Your tournament is just you and eight or nine other players. Your tournament is the table you're at. And if you look around at your table, Justin, if you look around your table and you're never going to be the next one out, then you're going to win the tournament. You know, and, and so much of, uh, you know, of successful tournament play is realizing it doesn't matter how big the field is, your tournament, you know, starts and, and, and ends at your table. So uh, don't worry too much about how big the field is. You are going to have to worry about it once you start getting to, you know, to that bubble. And you're going to have to worry a little bit about those psychological inflection points when you get, you know, close to the big money jumps, close to that final table. Uh, but for the most part, don't worry about the rest of the 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 the, uh, the the room. Don't worry about the average stack. Worry about your stack and worry about your table. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and shut the poker clinic down. We're going to uh, we're going to do some tournament uh, tournament play here in a little bit, and I I'll go ahead and oh, 
Circuit Sun, Circuit's On. Thank you so much, Fist Bump. Welcome to the crew. Thank you so much. Uh, and and for all of our new subscribers, thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and don't forget about our don't forget about our uh, our uh, subscriber chat only HPT viewing parties. We're going to have uh, uh, one on Monday, and then we're going to have the Rob Rob Perlman actually on Thursday, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, sitting down with a, another HP, a, HPT viewing party, Heartland Poker Tour. Thank you guys for letting us use the footage. Rob's going to be with us right here, and he's going to be going over the the actual event that he won. This was over at the Red Rock here in Las Vegas. Again, some pretty tough pros, and it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a great HPT viewing party. So thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and shut this down, and I'm going to be back here. Um, I think probably in about a, you know, pr probably pretty soon to uh, do some tournament replays. I'm going to see what's going on, and I'll I'll load it back up. I might take a little break, get a little bit of food in me. But thank you guys so much for joining us on this poker clinic. And we will be coming back with, uh, with a lot more content, a lot more streams. So stay with us. Streaming every day between now and the World Series of Poker with very few days off. Um, thank you guys. I hope that I hope if you have any questions, you, you've got me, Dutch at DutchBoy.com. So appreciate your time and keep on, you know, keep on uh, improving your game and getting better.